Show me the pledge of the flag, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon and welcome to the Brian Board of Public Affairs meeting for July 5th, 2022. First on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the January 21st, 2022 meeting. The board members have been supplied with a copy of the minutes. <coughs> Are there any questions, additions, or corrections? Seeing down June, Mike. I'd like to make a motion we accept the June 21st, 2022 minutes as written. Second. Dick? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Annette? Yes. Tom? Yes. Next is a hearing of public concerns. Is there anyone present that would like to address the board that's not on the agenda? Seeing none. Uh, next is presentation by American Municipal Power on the City of Bryan's power supply. Yeah, I'd like to welcome Craig. He's from AMP. Uh, um, I'd ask him to come up and give the board an update on our power supply. Uh, Craig's the director of uh, power supply planning. Uh, he's got a presentation. He's going to kind of go over some of our energy sources, our project involvements, uh, the energy market, maybe some transmission, install capacity, power rates, and stuff like that. <coughs> so thanks for showing up tonight. Craig. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I hope everybody had a good 4th of July. And, uh, so tonight uh, we'll go over your overall power portfolio. So we'll talk about all the different resources that you have. We'll talk about the energy markets and what's going on with those. Um, we've had a lot of volatility, just like you've seen prices at the pump are way up. We have a lot of movement in our energy markets. We'll then move on, quickly talk on capacity transmission costs, and then kind of end with an overall section, a little update on where power rates are. For the, the city of Bryan. So starting off, before we go in, we kind of need to know um, the different types of your wholesale power costs. And they're really broken down into three different buckets. We have energy, and that's almost the most easy to think about. The more power you use, the more you have to buy. It's a variable cost. For the most part, you guys deal in dollars per meg or cents per kilowatt hour. On the wholesale side, we have dollars per megawatt hour. I'll try to kind of translate between the two as we go through. The other two are more fixed costs, transmission and installed capacity. Transmission is the cost of building and maintaining the high voltage power lines that run throughout the area. You guys are located within the AEP area, so we have to pay for the cost of building and maintaining the AEP transmission system. Then there's installed capacity. This is a reliability charge to make sure that there's enough power plants at the time of the peak. You can think about this about on a hot summer day. Is there physically enough power plants out there? We can go back to not this winter, but the winter before, and down in Texas, they ran out of power plants, and they had to have blackouts, right? Um, so in our area, we have a separate charge that, that the overarching organization that's in control of this area charges in order to help make sure that that doesn't happen. Both transmission and installed capacity are fixed costs on a month-to-month -month basis, where energy changes based on how much your usage and how much it costs. So when we look at your overall energy sources, you'll see this pie chart has a lot of different pieces. And this is by design. You kind of think about this as your retirement portfolio, you wouldn't want to put it all in one different stock, right? You want to diversify. And that's what we're doing here is we've diversified to a lot of different pieces. The far left one there, Prairie State, that is a coal plant. The orange one down on the bottom, that's AFEC, that's a natural gas power plant. All those small slices on the bottom right, those are all different hydroelectric plants. The um, orange and the, the bright blue on the top right, those are different um, things that we're getting from the market. And then you can see on um, the top section there, a couple of you know, the, a couple resources that you guys have here within the city. So I'll go down each one of those. But the big thing I wanna kinda of point out is all of these different sources. Um, the biggest being um, the coal plant, which is about 25%. The natural gas, which is about 15, the hydros add up to around you know, 20, 25, and then the market about 25. So your biggest resources here, uh, Prairie State. Uh, this is a, a, a very large coal plant in southern Illinois. 
The reason we built this in Southern Illinois is because it's right on top of the coal. We don't have to worry about um, coal transportation costs as well as mining. It includes its own coal mine. Um, and that's when we have, you'll see later in this presentation, coal is having an issue right now in the United States, mining and getting it delivered. Uh, we don't have that issue at Prairie State because we have all of that control. The owners are all different public power entities throughout this, the Midwest. Um, so um, AMP, which is a collection of 134 different municipalities, our share is 368 megawatts. Your share of that is seven and a half megawatts or 7,500 kilowatts. Um, the plant came online in 2012. The debt goes to 2046. Um, and like I said, it includes 30 years worth of coal on site. So really no major um, operational issues and cost issues out of Prairie State currently. It's been humming along. The Fremont Energy Center, this is a natural gas, uh, a large natural gas power plant located just outside of Fremont, Ohio. So not too far away from here. Um, and once again, this is a newer plant came online a couple of years ago. Since then, we've been running it a lot because natural gas prices have been very cheap. Uh, we've been running this power plant more than expected, and um, it's been running fairly smoothly as well. The hydro. So you guys have um, slices of a lot of different hydro plants. The first one is NIPA Power, which stands for New York Power Authority. These are two hydro plants located in northern New York built by the federal government. And because they were built by the federal government, you guys being public power get a piece of those. Um, the biggest one is if you ever go to Niagara Falls and you drive just down uh, river, you'll see the Niagara plant. So you guys actually get a little bit of power out of there. This is also your cheapest resource because we didn't have to pay to build it. All we have to pay is the maintenance cost and the cost to move the power from northern New York. Um, we started getting that power back in the 70s and 80s. And at that time, we said, how do we get more of this really cheap power? And one of the solutions is, is if you build a hydroelectric <laughs> plant, you pay off your debt service or your mortgage costs, you're left with really cheap power. So we did that with our first plant, um, Belleville, uh, which is also known as JB5. That came online in 1999 on the Ohio River. Um, so we're actually getting closer to the end of debt service. So our mortgage on the plant goes through 2029, but really that plant should last, you know, 100, 150 years before, you know, you'd have major issues at the plant. Um, and then we started with our big project, Amp Hydro Phase 1. That was 1.8. So you get that's three different dams along the Ohio River where we went in. These are all existing dams where we went in and we, we built power plants um, on the existing dams. And then Meldow and Greenup were Phase 2. And Greenup is actually an existing plant that was um, built by the city of Hamilton back in the 1980s. So totaling all of that up, um, and this doesn't include the, the all glaze hydro, I've got that uh, later. But uh, this is another, that's about six megawatts or 6,000 kilowatts of hydro generation that you guys have. <coughs> and then your purchase from the market. So right now for that, that last little piece that you guys need from the market, it's about 24% of your energy needs. We went out and we purchased what's called a remaining requirements contract. So this serves the balance of your needs and it does it at a fixed price. And this is really, really nice because if you need a lot of power, we buy it at 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour. If you need very little, we buy it at 3.6 cents. So it perfectly meets your needs. Um, so we bought that from BP back in 2015, and we did that at a pretty low price compared to where the market is now, uh, $36 a megawatt hour or 3.6 cents. Um, now when we did that, we didn't include the solar and all glaze. Um, and so you guys will notice you guys actually sell a little bit of power back to the market and that's because those two units were not included when we said this is how much our existing resources were. So when we look at all of this, this is all of your resources stacked up, similar to that pie chart, but now we're looking out over time. On the bottom there, that brown is the Prairie State Coal. <coughs> In the middle, all of those blues and purples are hydro. The red is natural gas. Now you'll see two different resources that I didn't talk about roll off. That was a landfill <laughs> gas project um, that ended at the end of last year, and a Blue Creek wind which ends, um, which, which just ended. And then you'll see that BP contract sitting on the top. So that covers all of your energy needs all the way out through 2024. 
Once we get to 2025, you guys will be a little bit on the market, um, about 15, 20% on the market roughly, uh, starting in 2025. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about next, is the market, kind of where the status is, um, as well as, as a potential, um, something to help fill that gap. So when we talk about energy, energy is a commodity. You can buy it, you can sell it, just like oil. You know, we, we hear all the time about the price of crude oil is up or down. Um, energy is the same way. <coughs> and it's also very closely tied to the natural gas market. And that's because there's a lot of natural gas power plants in the United States. Um, so because they, natural gas is a major fuel to, to create electricity, those prices move in unison. And we can actually see that on this slide here. So we have natural gas prices in red, power prices in blue. And you can see as one goes up the other, um, and one goes down, the other one goes down. So this chart actually goes all the way back to 2000, and you can see what was happening back in the early 2000s. Prices were increasing. And then we got to 2005, and we were at a very high level of prices. The reason that's significant is a lot of our power plants that we decided to go forward with so Prairie State, um, the Hydros, even Fremont at the time, um, we're all, we made decisions to build those all back in the mid-2000s when, when not only were we seeing very high prices, but we were seeing that sustained year after year after year. The dotted line there is what the forecast was for power prices to do going forward. Then in two, late 2008, we had the economic crash and the Great Recession that drove prices down. Now you notice, prices didn't go back up. And that's because of shale natural gas and fracking. That really changed fundamentally both natural gas and power prices. Before then, we were actually importing natural gas into the United States. We were having to go out on the global market and buy really expensive natural gas to import. But because of the change in technology, um, all of a sudden we have a lot of natural gas that we were able to economically get out of the ground. And so that not only kept prices down, but pushed them down even lower. And that's where we've been for a long time. Um, really since 2010, uh, we've been in really low prices all the way up until this time last year. <coughs> and that's what I'm gonna be talking about in the next couple of slides, is this big spike up that we've seen in the last 12 months. So, before we talk about natural gas, I do want to talk about coal production in the United States because we still have a fair amount of coal plants. Back when we had COVID, um, back in 2020, there was a big fear that there was going to be a big, huge economic slowdown. And so we saw a large amount of shutdown in coal production in the United States. So this is showing um, coal production changes year over year. And you can see a big decrease in coal production in 2020. And you can see a little bit of an increase back in 21, 22, but in general, we lost a lot of coal production back in 2020. And that was, those were coal mines that closed and are not coming back. So we've, we've been seeing a big, huge wave of coal retirements. And with COVID, that kind of really accelerated um, coal mines closing. So there's still some out there, but compared to where we have been, uh, we're producing a lot less coal. So, that's important because when we start talking about natural gas and power prices, the last several years, you know, if, if natural gas prices tried to move up, power, coal plants would just kind of step in and take up the slack. But that's not really the case anymore because coal plants in this country are having trouble getting coal. Coal's very expensive. <coughs> it's costing more to mine because of the labor cost, as well as railing that coal is getting very expensive because of um, the rail costs. Now we look at the same chart, but now we're going to look at natural gas. And you can see we had the same thing in 2020. We had a dip, but that was kind of temporary. We didn't have these permanent closures of natural gas production. It was temporary, and you can see how strong um, natural gas production was in 2021, and then what's projected for 22 and 23. So really, natural gas production-wise in the United States, we've rebounded very quickly, and we're actually very close to record natural gas production. So if I've said electric and natural gas prices are very closely correlated, and we're at record natural gas production, why are we um, having such high natural gas and electric prices right now? So this chart helps to explain that. We have two lines here. 
we have production in red, so that's how much natural gas we are producing. And then in blue, we have consumption, how much we're, we're using, plus how much we are exporting out of the United States. And you can see back in 2020, when, when the recession hit, that red line was well above the blue line, meaning we were producing more natural gas in the United States than we were consuming. We had an excess. But you can see that pull down in natural gas production in 2020, but instead, everybody thought we were going to have a bigger recession with COVID and that production was going, you know, that consumption was going to go down. It didn't. You can see that blue line just goes flat right across. So all of a sudden, uh, when we get to 20, when we get, um, all of a sudden, you can see all, we have the blue line goes above the red, meaning that we are consuming more natural gas than we are producing. And that kind of goes and that's projected to continue all the way out through 2023. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that we as a country are, are using more natural gas. We're using about the same. The real difference here is how much natural <coughs> gas that we are exporting. We export natural gas two different ways. One is pipelines. That's primarily to Mexico so that they can have power. But the other is liquefied natural gas. That's where you take the natural gas, you chill it down until it's liquid, you put it on a ship, and you can ship it overseas. That has really been the big change. Back in, you know, if you remember back when I said in 2005, we were importing this liquefied natural gas. It was very, very expensive, very high prices. Right now, we are now exporters of natural gas in the United States. You can see these are a chart of natural gas export facilities that have been coming online. And you can see the last couple of years, right around 2020, a whole bunch of these natural gas export facilities came online and we started exporting a lot of natural gas uh, globally. Um, and so we've had that ramp up and that's really what's caused that supply and demand gap to close where we had excess production and now we're a little bit behind. And we are projected to be a little bit behind through next year. Then we're projected to catch back up. The reason we're projected to catch back up is you can see in 23 and 24, there's no new export facilities projected to come online. Um, so the export, the, the price right now for global natural gas is through the roof. Um, there's a, several reasons for that, but one of the big ones that everybody knows is, is the war in Ukraine, right? And um, that's driven up the, you know, there's not the, the gas flowing from Russia that there used to be. And that's driven up the price of liquefied natural gas in Europe as well as in Asia. So we're exporting as much as we physically can, but um, the nice thing is, is we've kind of hit this plateau where we don't have new export terminals coming online for a couple of years, and um, that's giving producers a chance to catch back up. Now, we've had some pretty volatile prices, and we've actually seen a drop in the last couple of weeks. That's because we actually had an explosion in one of the export facilities down in Texas. That knocked off 20% of natural gas um, exports through about the remainder of the year. So uh, we've seen a lot of volatility. When, when the supply and demand are really, really close together, it doesn't take much to move the needle in one direction or another. And this chart kind of shows this. This blue line is natural gas prices in the United States. And you can see historically, they've been around three, four dollars in MBTU. Starting last year because of weather and that, that tight supply and demand, they started increasing. And we've been seeing prices around, you know, at the beginning of this month, we were seeing prices around nine dollars in MBTU. And that was projected to continue all the way through the end of this year into next year when production was expected to catch back up. And then prices were expected to drop back down. The green line here, though, shows the potential volatility. So natural gas, like I said, is traded. And you can actually see what the, the volatility is around what the options are trading around natural gas. So you can see next winter, and that's what I want to point out here. Next winter, there's a chance um, that we could have three, four dollar, you know, two, three, four dollar gas. Like we had, you know, in previous winters up to this point for the last several years. There's also a chance an equal chance that we could see $35 in MMBTU gas next winter, right? So 
you know, you can kind of think about that, you know, um, if, you, you know, if, if uh, historically we've been paying three, and then we have, you know, your natural gas bill might be double next winter, right? That's a lot. But if it's three, four times as high, that would be a really, really big, big deal, right? So this is not saying that that's what we're going to have happen. Right now, the forwards are, you know, they've come down, but a couple weeks ago, they were up around uh, $10 in MMBTU for next winter. Um, and then you've come down a little bit since then. But I just want to kind of show what that volatility is. Um, it's through this summer and through next winter until supply has a chance to catch back up. Okay. So now this is kind of the more important slide. This is actually what power prices are trading at. Um, the left hand side is on peak prices, so that's price of power during the daytime. The right hand column there is prices of around the clock, so that's seven by 24 prices. So, um, you know, if you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, I'll talk about that top left circle first. Historically, in the summertime, we've seen on peak prices the last couple years at 50, maybe 60 bucks. We've seen prices trade for this summer as high as $200. So, from 50 to 60, all the way up to 200. Um, the, the sheet I just got this morning, um, you can see this was from a couple of weeks ago. We were looking at 150, 160. This morning it was down to 125, partially because uh, we haven't had any big heat on the East Coast yet. We've had, you know, concerns over a recession. Um, that's kind of, and then that natural gas explosion was going to kind of help to start push prices down. The bottom right hand strip, that top number, that 106, that's the price of power. Uh, 7 by 24 power for the remainder of the year. Um, and then you can see for future years. So if you want to buy 2023 power, this is saying $73. And then 2024 is 52. 25 is 47. And you can see that's about where it stays through 2027. Now I will say this is a couple weeks old. Right now those prices have actually dropped down about $45 for future years. So what we're seeing is we used to see prices um, for this 7 by 24 power, around three to three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Right now, they're all the way um, up to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And we're expecting those high prices through this upcoming winter. And then they're expected to come down to a new normal instead of three, three and a half. Right now, the market's showing around four and a half. But that's fairly volatile because, once again, there's a lot of supply and demand and there's a lot of uncertainty around where prices are. The whole point of this conversation is to kind of show that we've gone from a period of year after year after year where prices are really good. <laughs> I can get you a price quote, and that price quote would be good for, for, you know, for a month. Um, but we've gone back to where we were back in the mid-2000s, that 2005 time frame, where we have a lot of volatility in power prices. Now, it's supposed to get better this time next year. <coughs> Things are supposed to start calming back down. But a lot can change. You know, we weren't expecting this, these high prices this time last year, right? So a lot can change in 12 months. Okay. So um, we did kind of show that you guys are majority protected from this. You guys have a remaining requirement deal that satisfies all of your needs through 2024. So the question becomes, okay, Starting in 2025, what should we be looking at to help start filling this? One option that we are that AMP is currently negotiating is a 15-year um, purchase from a solar facility. So similar to like the one that you guys have here in Bryan, but this is just a bigger facility. So and we're talking about a 150 megawatt facility potentially. We've been negotiating um, uh, on a 15-year flat price. Um, I can tell you. When we originally did our RFP a little over a year ago, that price was about 3.8 cents a kilowatt hour. Now we're looking at the price at about four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so the price is up a little bit, but you would get capacity and recs on top of that. So that should pull the price down. As well as when you look, um, compared to the forward market prices, this does look pretty attractive. Um, our recommendation, AMP's recommendation, is not to have a huge chunk of this. We're saying 5% of your overall energy needs, right? So this would lower you guys from like 15, 20% on the market down to like 10, 15% on the market, right? 
and kind of just and just another little piece of that overall diverse portfolio. So that's, this is just kind of showing what that would potentially look like. Right now we're probably showing, um, we, it could be 24, but most likely it would have a 2025 start date is what we're looking at. And that would kind of line up pretty well. <coughs> end of your, your BP contract. Um, so that gets me to the end of your energy section. Any questions? I know I, uh, on so far on, on the energy markets or your overall energy position. When you talked about the coal mines close now, I guess that I never thought about that, is that they would suffer the same predicament that a lot of the other industries did. And with the early retirements and stuff and the mines have closed down and with the shipping expenses going up, are, what are they predicting for the future for coal fire plants? So right now we've, we've had a lot of coal retirements. That trend is expected to continue through the end of 2030 um, of, of, of can coal plants continuing to, to retire. Um, different areas of the country that has different impacts. Where we are, we've built, because we sit, you know, Eastern Ohio and Western Pennsylvania has a lot of natural gas. So there's been a lot of natural gas. We've been actually building natural gas plants just as fast, if not faster, than we bring retiring coal plants. So we've just kind of been switching in this region. Um, that could, but that retirement of coal could definitely produce challenges like it, it has down in Texas. Um, and, you know, the southeast and different areas could see impacts from, from that. Um, and we could too, it, you know, it just depends if we keep building the natural gas plants that, that balance that out. Yeah, go somewhere. Okay, thank you. Will the Supreme Court decision have any effect on anything? Yeah, I have not talked about legislation. <laughs> and there's a reason why, because that could have, I mean, that's really the wild card, right? Like we could have, you notice I didn't talk, like, did talk about, you know, sometimes you hear these goals of 50% or 100% renewable, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the prices that I'm showing, that's just what the market's trading at. That doesn't price in if all of a sudden we want to go to 100% renewable or something like that, some sort of legislation that gets passed. So. You know, anytime I can tell you, like on the solar panels that we were just that solar deal that we were just looking at, um, there was a um, right now there's a, a tariff on on uh, solar panels coming from China. Um, then there was this question, what about solar panels coming from Southeast Asia? And there was this, they said no, that they were going to get tariffed. And then they just put out a two-year moratorium on the tariff. And so <laughs> we've been going back and forth on this solar deal for almost two years, and part of it is because of not knowing what the tariffs are gonna be, if any, on the solar panels coming from overseas. And that has a large driver on what solar prices are gonna be. So, yeah, definitely you can have an impact from any of those things. Well, now the, sol <coughs> the Supreme Court limited something to do with the clean air. Carbon emissions. Carbon emissions with yeah. the Clean Air Act or something like that. Yeah, so meaning the EPA can't go out and yeah. impose carbon uh, okay. without, now Congress can still go decide to do it, but it would take all of Congress, you know, you know, they still could pass, it would take the normal legislative process. It just couldn't be like an um, executive action or whatever. Is that solar facility that you're negotiating with in Ohio? Yeah, it actually, so you guys are buying some, so we're, we're, we've done an RFP and they were the winner of the RFP, but it's been so long, we're still talking to several different suppliers, but they're the leading candidate. It's actually um, with where Blue Creek Wind Farm is, so just south okay. of Van Wert. And the, the interesting thing is that one of the reasons their costs are so low is because they already have the wind turbines sitting there. And so they can just lease the land underneath the wind turbines and they have the transmission infrastructure there so they don't have to build out a whole bunch of power lines and stuff to the side they already have control. So um, not to say that that's who we're going to end up with, um, but we are primarily um, trying to keep it in close geographically um, in this area. And that would be, I guess I should point out, when we look at things like Prairie State, the hydros, a lot of those, you guys own those. This would be a power purchase agreement where you guys would not be owning, you just would be buying the power for a 15 year term. So you wouldn't have any um, ownership risks like we do with some of the other assets. <coughs> so
So now I'm going to talk about that other um, charge. We talked about the energy section of the, of the cost. Now I'm going to talk about the transmission and installed capacity. Uh, so transmission, this is the cost of building and maintaining the high voltage power lines. Uh, you guys are located in the AEP area, um, so uh, you guys have to pay the cost of the AEP transmission system. And unfortunately, it's one of the highest, um, so and it's been getting higher. So AEP is not making money on its power plants as much anymore, neither is First Energy. So they are focusing much more on their transmission infrastructure. The, a lot of the transmission infrastructure in the United States, you know, is 30, 40 years old. So you know, it's 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 older. It's not like it's it, they're um, just throwing money, but they're also spent because they're not making money on the power plants. They're doing things pretty quickly, and you can see in the last five years we've seen a doubling in transmission prices. Um, so that has gone up pretty in a big way. Now I do want to point out how they bill for transmission is based on your load during for AEP's peak hour of the year, and that can be in the summer or the winter time. The last two years it's been in the summertime. The reason I point that out is. Whatever we can do to lower our load whenever AEP peaks helps to save our transmission bill. So you'll notice that's when you guys are running all of your different generation that you have. I also know you guys send out alerts saying, hey, this is one of the peak days. And it's not like we're having reliability problems. It's just that we're trying to lower the amount of charges that we're getting from AEP for their transmission costs. Um, and that really helps to save everybody economically when we're doing that. So you can see what happens. The white bar here is if is how much AEP <coughs> transmission costs. The red bar shows when you guys are running all of your power plants what your net costs are. So when we look at 2020, we'll look at uh, 2022 here. So if you guys did not have all of your power plants, you guys would be up over two and a half cents a kilowatt hour of your bill just going to transmission. But because of all your power plants, you guys are like at a half a cent. Right? So that really helps to offset. And you can see in past years, sometimes it's been negative. You guys have actually been generating more credits. So really, all of that work that you're doing with all of your power plants that you have behind your meter here, and Brian, as well as the, you know, from the peak alerts and lowering your usage, has really been paying off, and you guys aren't seeing um, near the impact of transmission costs that other means do, and other load and first energy, and AEP. <coughs> Um, so PJM's installed capacity market, PJM is, is the big governing body for the area um, and they kind of tell everybody what to do. And part of their job is to make sure that there is enough power plants out there at the time of the peak, like I was talking about earlier. <coughs> they run a market for this um, and they are supposed to run it three years in advance but they've been arguing about the rules so they've only been running it one year in advance. Um, the prices here can be pretty volatile. They go up and down, um, but the last two auctions you can see have been pretty cheap. So our capacity prices have actually been decreasing. These are billed when PJM peaks. So just like when you get billed for transmission when AEP peaks, um, these are billed when all of PJM peaks and there's not just the highest, it's the five highest. So this is something else um, that we also uh, try to run all of the power plants for is to lower our load during these five peak days. And once again, you guys have a lot of resources to help offset your costs here. So instead of paying um, you know, half cent, one cent a kilowatt hour, you guys are pretty much flat, if not slightly negative, impact to your overall rate um, from capacity. So that's one of the really nice things about all the generation you guys have. Um, and like I said, you guys send out uh, the peak notification sets, but the reason we're doing that is for the sake of so I want to just kind of mostly focus on that last line there, right? So right now, when we send out those peak alerts, and then you guys send out your alerts on your system, you know, you turn off during those six hours during the transmission and the capacity peaks, for a 100 watt light bulb, that's saving $16 a year. Right? So, I mean, hopefully you guys don't have 100 watt light bulbs in your house anymore and you got something a little more efficient, but that starts to put it in context that there can be real savings here. And that's why we get, you know, that's why we send out those alerts. That's why you guys are running those generators is to lower those capacity and transmission costs. Um, but I did want to break out, you know, when we talk about, you guys have Always Hydro, 
you guys have your combustion turbine and diesel units, as well as the solar facility. And for this year, we know how much those, this is not on the energy side, so they're also helping us some on the energy, but just the capacity and transmission side, you guys are seeing $5 million in savings from running those units. So yeah, I know like the cost of diesel fuel is up and, and natural gas costs are up and things and there's labor costs, but you guys are seeing a fair amount of savings from, from running those units. Um, just a couple of slides here on power rates. So um, this is your wholesale power costs from AMP. Um, and you can see historically you guys have been sitting right around $60 or $0.06 cents a kilowatt month. And that's really kind of where we're expecting for the next two years. So you can see it goes up a little bit in 23 and 24, but that's just because we don't assume that we're going to guarantee to hit those 1 and 5 CPs, those peaks, those, you know, those, um, that 1 and 5 hours of the year. We assume a 66% success when we do the budget. So when you assume 100% success, that actually pulls it right back down to that you know, six cents a kilowatt hour that we have. Now the real concern you can see is more um, 24 going into 25. And you can see um, that's a $7 a megawatt hour or 0.7 cents a kilowatt hour potential rate impact. Um, and that's because of those higher prices I'm talk I've been talking about. So that's one nice thing is you guys, um, you guys have this diverse portfolio to help protect, so it's not near as big as it could be. I will say, this is also very dependent on what the markets are right now, and those are very volatile. So I ran this on a pretty big impact day. Um, the prices were up, but we can have smaller, it could go bigger, it just depends on what happens with the forward price curve. But the big thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind is really we should see flat prices for 23 and 24, and then 25, you know, we have, until we lock something in out there, now if we get the solar deal going, that should help lower that as well as lock some of that in, but we have some uncertainty there. But it's not 100%, right? Like we still are 85, you know, 80, 85% hedged out there. The other thing I wanna talk about is local utility rates, because this is good, this is something that, that has been changing. Um, so the local utilities, um, the way they do is they have a standard service offer. Um, so like I'm a first energy customer, I, <coughs> also, I'm, I, I um, have the standard service offer because I've been chosen my own supplier. The way they serve that is they hold auctions. And anybody can serve that. And um, they used to hold auctions for three years in length. They would blend out the prices for three years. But because there was that delay in the capacity markets, they're no longer auctioning off the power for three years they are only holding 12 month auctions. So when we look at AEP, AEP held two auctions to serve its load. They held an auction in November and one in April. And because of those higher prices, AEP in June is seeing a $20 a megawatt hour or two cents a kilowatt hour rate increase. Um, so that's effective June 1st and that'll be showing up in everybody's bills they receive in July. First Energy, the impact of these higher prices that we've been seeing in the last 12 months is not as bad. And that's because they held three auctions. They held one in August, one in October, and then one in March. So they only saw a $15 or one and a half cent increase in June. But I, I know Dayton Power and Light's a little bit far south for you guys, but I wanted to put it on here. They only had one auction, and they had it in March when power prices were really high. Um, like we've been seeing now, and they're seeing a $60 a megawatt hour or six cents a kilowatt hour rate increase down in Dayton Power and Light. So I've already warned my parents, they, they are on Dayton Power and Light, that their, that their June bill that they get in July is going to be a lot higher. So this is, this is, um, this is starting to hit the news in Dayton, um, but this is probably something that's going to hit the news this summer as we go through about these investor owned utilities rates going up. Um, I just kind of wanted to point out, you know, we're talking, I just got done talking to you guys, is that your rates should be pretty flat. They have been the last couple of years, and we're expecting that through at least 2024. So that's something I know um, Nathan's kind of with this quote, uh, Brian Municipal Utilities, diverse power portfolio, along with closely managing our budget, has positioned itself to limit impacts to its customers due to rising natural gas, coal, and wholesale power costs. And that's something I think you guys you know, need to be aware of and talking to your, your residents and customers about that. You know, 
Right now, we've got prices at the pump that are double. Inflation's up, you know, nine, nine, ten percent, right? Um, natural gas prices we just saw. We went from two, three dollars, and, and now right now forwards are close to nine dollars. Well, they've come up a little bit, but we've seen higher prices across the board. But because of the work that you guys have done and the decisions that we've, you guys have made, um, you guys are looking at flat power costs in the middle of that because the power markets right now are not flat. And the investor-owned utility people, uh, people that are paying that in the investor-owned utility rates are starting to see that. So. And that is all I have. The rest is just my contact information, the folks in the planning team. So I'll open it up to questions. I think it's important, uh, you know, to talk about how you said uh, closely tied like gas is with electricity costs and gas has been going through the roof. You can ask just about anybody that doesn't know that. So uh, with, you know, basically feeding on that, it's, it's our, you know, we, we've hedged ourselves. We've hedged ourselves to get through this time right that we have right now. How long does it last? I don't know. But we're in a position right now that we don't have to do some of those things. Uh, by having this diverse portfolio, as long as we keep following that path, you know there may come a time that we won't be able to. But by managing these two things with the budget and the way that we balance our portfolio has helped us get through this trying time. And we can, you know, take a, a hit here or there, uh, but ultimately I think we've done a good job of keeping it uh, flat for our rate payers. Or and absolutely, there, and it doesn't mean that we there's not things that can't pop up that we're not anticipating. Right. But that comes back to when you have a diverse portfolio and you have all of these different things, if you have one little thing that pops up, you have everything else to help uh, mitigate that. And I think another thing too is our generation assets. Just, I don't think our customers really understand how much money we save by having those assets. Absolutely, because like I said, transmission costs have doubled. And if, you, you know, if you're a municipality that does not have any of those, um, there's also your guys' as well as um, like JV2 you guys are in, and I didn't mention that one. Those are all helping protect um, against those transmission costs. And yeah, if you're not, you're, you, in the last five years, your transmission costs have doubled, yep. uh, as well as capacity, which is bouncing all around. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate you coming down, Craig. Absolutely. Thanks for Thank you. Thanks for it was, it was interesting. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Too. I certainly appreciate everything that we get from AMP and OMEA and the guidance that we provide over the years. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is a presentation by Spangler Candy Company regarding the Brian Water Tower. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, my name is Kirk Basher. I'm the chairman and CEO of, of Spangler. And uh, we've come to talk about a proposal that we want to make tonight. And the proposal is really uh, an answer to a question, and that's how can we strengthen an existing community asset, being uh, the water tower, which is located on the Spangler campus. Uh, I've got about half a dozen slides that I'll go through relatively quickly, but this has some background uh, on Spangler Candy. We're in our fourth generation of family leadership, so I'm a fourth generation Spangler. My mother was Kathy uh, Spangler, and my great-grandfather was Omar Spangler, who founded the company and also was, I think, instrumental in my understanding in forming the BPA, and I think he was on the first uh, the first board as well. So it's very appropriate that, I, that I'm here uh, representing Spangler. And, uh, you know, it's been 116 years that Spangler uh, Candy Company has been here in Bryan, and I think the family's always thought about what can we do to uh, leave assets for the, the next generation, whether that be uh, Omar Spangler helping out with the BPA, and of course there's countless other examples with the uh, um, different infrastructure projects, but that's how we want to think about what can we leave for our, our kids in the next generation for the next 100 years. Uh, we're the second largest employer in the city of Bryan. We currently employ about 450 people. I think that will be north of 500 when we start our bit of honey operation, which will be uh, later this fall in the early, early winter. Uh, we make about 3 billion pieces of candy every year. Um, and of course, we contribute to Bryan in, in lots of different ways, and not to go over all these things. Some of them are financial uh, in the sense of being the largest contributor to 
uh, the United Way or donations to the YMCA Children's Play Center, but some of them are just being involved in the community. And I would argue just having 450 employees that are actively engaged in different community activities, that's probably the power of the, the company, more so than just some of the donations that, uh, that we're able to give. Uh, on economic impact, uh, our gross payroll is about $21 million. And we did add it up, the City of Bryan income tax for both corporate and what we withhold from our employees is over half a million dollars uh, a year, so it definitely adds up. We invest about $8 million of capital into the, the factory uh, on average, some, some years it's more. Uh, we've recently bought the West Campus, as we're calling it, so this is the old Ingersoll Rand or New Era, it's the area kind of around where the water tower is. And that's undergoing a renovation right now. I'd say we're almost done with it. We've just waiting for some final things with the fire alarm so that we can actually uh, open it up. But that's 300,000 square feet in addition to the 520,000 square feet we have on our main campus. So we've got about 800,000 square feet under roof now. And uh, for this group, uh, this is a new factory that's going into the West Campus. I mean, we're making major facility upgrades and HVAC units and electrical, and so that will have an impact on our uh, utility usage, which of course helps kind of drive uh, costs down or puts downward pressure, right? If we can spread out some of the fixed costs in our community over a larger, larger base. Uh, for context, uh, the bit of honey operation is about will be about 15 percent more production than what we currently are doing on our, on our West Campus. So it's definitely some more, but it's not the uh, overwhelming amount that we need to uh, start thinking about new power generation or buying, buying things like that. So the water tower is I mean, it's literally in the middle of our 40-acre uh, campus. Uh, it's circled there in, in red, and here's a, it, so the main campus is there on the right side, and the, the bit of honey area is actually that white roof all the way on the left side. Here's just another another vantage point. This is kind of a drone shot over our main campus looking west. So we've been trying to answer this question besides just holding water, you know, how can we make this tower even a larger asset for the community? And we just started asking some questions, you know, how can it become a landmark for Brian? How can it become an opportunity to promote the city? Uh, how can it become a work of art uh, that makes visiting and living in our community more, more fun? Uh, and how can it become a great photo opportunity? So we asked these questions. We didn't have the answers to them, but working with the BPA and the BMU, Derek, and, uh, and Nathan, we started asking these questions together. And how do we get the answers? Well, they put us in touch with this guy named Eric Henn who is this fantastic artist, and he paints and goes around the world and paints these giant murals, uh, many times on water towers, but not always on water towers. He's done this for 30 years. He's got all kinds of awards, and he's done work from Australia to Los Angeles, and hopefully we can get him here in, uh, in Bryan, Ohio. Here is just some of his work. He does all this by hand on a lift, and the the picture there in the upper right, with the, when he's painting that turtle, you can see him there on the on the lift. But absolutely amazing, it's hand painted. And so we started thinking, okay, what what can we do um, that will be a fun landmark for for our community? And so the idea that we came up with collectively, after a bunch of different iterations, was what if we make our water tower have giant dumbbells? And I don't know the exact height of those, but I'm guessing around maybe 75 foot high dum-dums. We'll have to get the exact figure, but the idea that there would be eight different dum-dums around the top of the water tower, and then you can see that we'd use the, the legs of the water tower to act as the sticks and paint uh, the colors underneath that. And then on the middle, uh, it would have Bryan, Ohio, and we'd have that on two sides so you can always see that it was Bryan. Here's a couple other um, viewpoints. So from any, any side of the water tower, you're going to see four uh, dum-dums with two of them very clearly and then two of them kind of on the sides. So the proposal that we'd like to make is, um, you know, one just for maintenance period, the water tower needs to be repainted, right? And so uh, Spangler would like to contribute uh, $25,000 towards what we're calling the base 
coat, um, and that will help with that in future maintenance. And then the cost of the artist and all the artwork associated with it and the paint and the lift and all, all that, uh, that is something that Spangler would like to cover 100% so that there's no out-of-pocket cost for the, uh, uh, for the residents of, of Bryan and the, the, the rate payers. Um, I think that's appropriate. If, if you didn't know any better, you would think it is the Spangler Water Tower because it's right in the middle of our, our campus. We think this is, uh, we're also going to provide a viewing platform on our property that would just allow people to come take uh, selfies. Uh, and if we want to get Brian Ohio on social media, this is certainly a great way to do it because I can see lots of people uh, getting their selfie and, and, and texting it. To us, this is a, a, a larger initiative I think that the community is going through right now is making sure that we have uh, attractions within the, the city so that Brian can become a destination. Uh, and, and I think we've got these assets coming together that really we can do this. And part of it is uh, we've had our Spangler Store Museum, which has been at our main campus, which opened just as an experiment when we had our 100th anniversary. It was just an enormous success. We really expanded. Uh, it was We just outgrew it. And uh, now we've got this place on the east side of the square. Uh, it's going to be able to attract a lot more visitors than our old store. The hours will be longer. There'll be a, uh, a theater. We'll have more kid-friendly activities. So we're really excited about this. And it can really be part of, again, an attraction for our local community, amongst other things that we're doing, the new playground, and the things that we're doing at Chris Kendall, and some more restaurants coming downtown. And I think this water tower can be a piece of that, right? A reason to come to Bryan and spend the day because there's plenty of activities to do besides just go to one particular uh, particular uh, place. So we're super excited about this. This should open in, in 2023. And that's the design. That's the proposal we wanted to present to you. And um, I guess Nathan, I'll, I'll let you talk about what next steps are, unless anyone has any questions for me. Yeah, we can open it up for questions if you'd like. Yeah, bet between uh, the three of us, we can hopefully answer most of your questions, or four of us. On, on one of your slides, Kirk, you said uh, this area can't have water tower of the year. I know Montpelier always gets claims for the best water quality in the year. Is there any competition for best water tower in the country? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There is. Yes. There is. Eric, we've already talked to Eric Hen a little bit, and he has said that there's a, we're going to be in the running. And this is the guy who's the artist who paints these all over the world, and he has already said you're going to be in the running for some awards. And, and my understanding is it wouldn't, that it goes on some calendar that they end up doing. Yes. That would not be ready for, for the calendar 2023, that it would be eligible for the, the 2024 uh, calendar. Correct. And yeah, that's certainly our hope that we get. Well, I hope so. <coughs> Well, being on his website the, of things that he did, he re this reaches out to, you know, just like Spangler's does. It's not just Bryan, Ohio, or Ohio. You guys probably get people through your store from all over the, the world, right? I mean, oh, all something over like... The, all over the country, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So you're going to see the same thing, you know, with, with this being, uh, you know, pictures taken of it. Who knows? It could be all over the place, too, you know, not just an Ohio thing, but it could yeah. be... Uh, something that people agree I think it's something when you're driving into town like you're gonna see you know you see our courthouse which is obviously a beautiful landmark and then you're, you're gonna see this so the history of the courthouse and the vibrancy of the of something that's more modern you know I have uh, a couple of grandkids that I have several grandkids but a couple that they take trips every once in a while and they'll go to some place that has the world's biggest sombrero or the biggest rocking chair or the biggest something and get their picture taken with it. So I think something like this is just going to be a natural to fit right in with somebody wanting to come to town because the kids want to see the world's biggest dum-dum, but a series of dum-dums. When we first opened the store museum, we put a <coughs> billboard up on I-9, up on the turnpike. We had to take it down because there were so many people that were coming coming in. So I, I think you're right. I think really? it's going to be quite an attraction that's worth uh, a drive-in for, for out-of-towners. 
Yeah, I think it's a, a great thing to attract. I mean, everything you guys have done for this community for well over 100 years, you know, the investment in the community that, that you have, you know, done for our community, uh, I think something like this is, you know, uh, another one of those things. I mean, on its own, but the combination of everything that you're doing, I think it's a great asset for the community that, you know, you're always going to get a few people out there that may not. And those are maybe people that would scream the loudest, but I think it's important to know that there is no cost to a ratepayer whatsoever, not a dime. Uh, this is something that Spangler wants to do uh, for the good of our community, and this is just a partnership that uh, they are offering us to take part of. Uh, so, um, and we would not be setting a precedent with it. Since the arrow had their logo on there, one that's time. what. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It had the arrow emblem on the side of it for years and years. As it was known as the Arrow Tower. Yeah. You know. And yeah, I think I think it will attract a lot of people. I mean, from the the little tweaks that the uh, that the the artist, the, the painter made. You know, the suggestions he made to help uh, make it look nicer and make sure that. Yeah, there's uh, been a lot of thought on the colors yeah. and having the right yeah. the, the darker colors on the. Where the sunlight's hitting and, mm -hmm. and to make sure when people see it they know where it is if they're not from around here they'll know exactly where it is yeah. so how did you pick what dum dum would be uh, on the tower well because my favorites no i'm just yeah. kidding <laughs> <laughs> no we didn't we didn't try to think which one look which ones look well next to each other which ones have uh, not all the the wrappers have different uh, different colors so like the watermelon there's got a red and a green and I think looks good against the red background. So, um, and we did want to put the mystery because that is that is a fun one that people people really really and, enjoy. And it will be lit up at night. That was my concern because I know Diane was part of. I think that I think that make yeah I think multi hundred watt light bulbs yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> LED LED. Yeah, I think that's on our kind of I think to, really to, figure, need, to figure out. Yeah. Um, I personally like the uh, how the, the the you know the sticks and then it goes back down to the color matching the the yeah. dum sucker at the top. I personally really like that look. Yeah, I think the drawing's very classy, and I just um, you know the city of Bryan has been fortunate to have a number of business partners long term. Um, obviously, Spangler, you are one of the top of that list, and I want to say that I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that everyone has put in, including Derek and Nathan, on this because it was pretty fast-tracked once the idea started rolling and there was a lot of commitment on your end and I don't think you hesitated for a minute, um, which I think is, is really great at expressing the fact that you want to make sure you're taking care of the community more than you're taking care of you know yourself individually. You've made sure that this isn't a cost to the ratepayers. You've made sure that you know, you've had conversations with the artist and helped carry that load and I just I think it's a fantastic marketing tool for the whole community not just Spangler but I very much appreciate your continued partnership thank you yeah this is not something this is our first time seeing it we've talked about this uh, before and, and have uh, looked at it so uh, I guess with that I, I guess we have prepared a couple resolutions uh, in case the board thought this was a good idea to partner with uh, Spangler, uh, and we do, uh, I guess, uh, have a couple resolutions that would need to be done because of the artist's uh, availability. A lot of this stuff had to be hurried along, along with uh, getting our tower painted and, and making sure that you know everything with our tower was where it needed to be to be it was you know there was actually a pretty slim chance of this even working out between all parties because I think initially they gave us a 20% chance of this even working because uh, the, the time that our tower needed to be painted uh, the artists availability uh, and a lot of other things were really working against us uh, uh, but I mean like I said, a lot of good people came together, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. But it's more importantly, is, is the board excited about it, and do they want to move forward with uh, <coughs> the resolutions? And me, it's how we're, we're kind of behind the gun. We've been kind of kicking this around. We'd like to get, get, get it going. Before, you know, we did that time of the summer where we're going to run out of warmth. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think we're just about the end of the windows closing on us a little bit. We're going to get this done in a timely manner. We need to we need to act. I believe. I, I can have uh, Derek. We got two resolutions, and they're kind of uh, grouped in with these resolutions. But uh, I mean, I guess the best way to tell if you're on board with it or not is to, to uh, have Derek maybe let's talk about the first resolution. Uh, excuse me. The the first resolution has several different parts to it. Um, one of them is accepting the agreement between BNU and Spanglers. Um, this agreement covers the approval of the design as well as other general terms and conditions. It also would accept the donation to cover the cost to have the mural painted on it. It would also accept the donation for the base coat painting and any future maintenance. And then it would also that request that city council accept the same donations and appropriate the funds um, in the 502 uh, professional services line item and also the 502 water tower maintenance line item. So that would be your first resolution. Yeah, first. Unless you guys have questions about that. Are there any questions on that? No. Not Let's get your goal. Yes. Lori, would you number and read? Yes, sir. Resolution number 31, 2022. Authorizing a water tower agreement with Spangler Candy Company and accepting donations towards the design and painting of the Bryant Water Tower. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. Thank you. With that, I'd like to make a motion we adopt the resolution thirty-one. I second it. Dick. Yes. Tom. Yes. Jim. Yes. Annette. Yes. Karen. Yes. So there's also a, a second resolution. Um, what this resolution is, is authorizing the Director of Utilities to accept the proposal from Utility Service Company, and that is for the, the painting of the, that design. Um, and then we would anticipate this project and this portion of the painting to start mid-September. So basically the first resolution was with Brian, Municipal Utilities and Spanglers. This is with uh, utility service services for uh, uh, hiring the, the muralist and, 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 and taking care of that. That will be between us. So we need that. Yeah. Okay. So, Lori, would you never read this one also, please? Resolution number 32, 2022. Authorizing the Director of Utilities to accept <coughs> a proposal from Utility Service Company Incorporated for a new logo design and painting of the Bryan Water Tower. Questions? If not, I will accept the motion to approve. We'll make a motion. We accept Resolution 32 uh, with Suez, Utility Service Company. Second, Karen. Yes. Annette. Yes. Jim. Yes. Dick. Yes. Tom. Yes. Thank you. Derek, I have a question for you. Where do we stand with uh, Suez? Have we entered into a contract with them? Or? Yes. We have. Okay. Yeah, so we're on. Yeah. Uh, now we'll just be trying to work out the schedule. <laughs> okay. And thanks for all your hard work. I yeah. know all the confusion and the pressure you've been under. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Next number five. Resolution to authorize change order number one for the power plant substation phase one major equipment. Mr. Caruso would be the man to talk about this a little bit. I wish I was first because everybody else had a lot cooler stuff to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> power, Craig. Cool water tower, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> um, a couple switches, uh, G switches, for the select uh, power uh, in the power part of the uh, housing, uh, the panels. A couple switches was left off that would help with SCADA control for future use to actually remotely control that panel um, for twenty six hundred dollars, twenty six hundred and ten dollars. 
for those two switches, which includes the installation, the wiring, and the switches. Um, it's well within in that uh, one of the motorized switches that I bought for industrial sub in order to add some of the RTU stuff out of curtain was, was about $1,500 just for the switch. So these are a little bit less costly switches, but they this is the time to put them in. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself a little bit on that, Lori. Would you number and read this one too? Please? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Resolution number 33, 2022, authorizing change order number one for the power plant substation phase one major equipment. And all these, uh, pretty much the major equipment was uh, under budget, so the but there's plenty of money left in there to cover this. Yeah, this this, this will not hurt the cost of or. Uh, hurt us by getting the concrete, the rebar, and, and all the other things that we have to buy right. in order to um, start working on the substation this fall. Yeah. Any questions for Mr. Burris? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the change order. Resolution 33. I'll second that. Dick? Yes. Jim? Yes. Yes. Karen? Yes. Tom? Yes. Next is a request to place an engineering department employee on regular employment status. Um, this is a request to move Stuart Martin from probationary engineering assistant three to regular employment status. Uh, Stuart's been with BMU since 2018, and he's developed the skills to perform at the engineering assistant three level. Um, in addition, he has nearly completed uh, two degrees at Northwest State, um, a project management degree and a business management degree, um, all while working full time. Uh, he remains a great asset to BMU. He has a positive attitude. He's always willing to help others. Semi-monthly disbursements. Can I have a motion to pay the bills? I will move to pay the bills. <coughs> I'll second. Tom? Yes. Jim? Yes. Annette? Yes. Yes. Karen? Yes. Next is comments from BPA and staff. Hey. Uh, yeah, just congratulations to Stuart. He is a great asset. I uh, appreciate him every day. He is a, a, a great person. Uh, I want to thank Craig uh, for coming out from AMP and being able to share some of the power supply uh, information. I think that's always uh, good stuff for not only the board, but for the public to see what, uh, you know, the main message was that we do have a diverse portfolio and it, it saved us from, I mean, it would be a perfect time to raise uh, rates because you could look around and give every justification for it, but we're, we don't have to because right now. Uh, we're safe right now because of the way that uh, everything has been working. So hopefully we can get through this and, and, and not get to that point. So I think that was important to, to see. And also, I, I want to thank Spangler for all their hard work. I think it's going to be a great partnership, and I'm really excited to see, uh, look up there in September and see him crawl around the tower and the progress that he makes. So I'm excited about that. And thank you, guys. Mayor. Yeah, um, I can echo all of that, and I do want to add I have been waiting for this night to come because a couple weeks ago my <coughs> was traveling to Fort Wayne and we went through Edgerton and they have their Edgerton Bulldog and things on the water tower and my kids were watching it and and they're like, you know, it'd be really cool if we had some cool painting on the towers and Brian Mom and I'm like, well, I'm not in charge of that and they're like, well, what about a dum dum? Wouldn't that be amazing? And I'm just sitting there going, you know. <laughs> So I, I have been holding on to that for a couple weeks and, and very excited to share 
Um, but thank you again. I think it's going to be a great project. And, and Derek, whenever you come and think that it's never going to happen, just remember perseverance pays off, right? You're, you're learning all that magic happens around here sometimes. So thank you. <coughs> yeah, I'm just looking forward to that painting. It's going to be fun to watch. I also want to say good job to Derek because it's been a, it's been a job putting all of these agreements together and coordinating all of that, and he's done a great job with that. Well, I too am really excited about Spangler's putting up the candy on the tower. I think anyone who works for the city who knows me very well would say I'm your number one fan. I eat probably more candy than anybody in the city. <laughs> so, and I remember from the old days of Gene coming over to Arrow when I worked at Arrow. Um, he would look at our candy dish and he'd go, "That's carcinogens in there. You need to get more of ours. And then we, trust me, we bumped up more of our Spangler candy. You know, I wasn't going to tell on you for that. <laughs> On a second note, I would like to request the board's permission to re-advertise and repost for the account clerk position in my office. We received a very limited number of candidates, and we would like to open it up. So I am requesting your permission to <coughs> repost. Do you need a motion? I do. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we give Lori the authorization to repost. I'll second it. Dick? Yes. Annette? Yes. Jim? Yes. Karen? Yes. Tom? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Betts. No, good. Al? No, thanks. Mr. Caressa. Derek. Tom. Where's me for? <laughs> I know you got something you want to say. Yeah, congratulations to uh, Stuart Martin for his change in status and uh, for Craig for his uh, presentation on the uh, power and energy and so forth. And uh, of course, the Spangler Candy Company. It's, uh, it's going to be a, something that's going to be up there for a long time. We have, we hope uh, millions and millions of people come to see it, bring some more business into Bryant. Thank you for your generosity. Karen. Yes, I also want to congratulate Stuart, uh, proud of what he's done here. And I, I love hearing the refresher amp. And uh, it always amazes me when you come up with the numbers and, you know, the one number that blew me away was the peak shaving revenue over five million dollars, and that's what the that's what everybody's doing, industry and the residents, and uh, you know every time you help during that peak shaving period, this is what it's saving, and it just boils down to that number, and that just is awesome. But it's interesting also to see what's coming in the future, near future, and prolonged. So it, it's. Not all that scary, after all. You know, a little bumps in the roads. So, um, <coughs> and yes, thank you to Spanglers. This is going to be a real fun thing to look at every day. It's something we can all be proud of. Thank you for all your hard work, and and uh, the idea is great. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of like to echo what they said, but congratulations to Stuart, and uh, thanks again to Spanglers. We've been kind of kicking this around, and I'm glad it came to be. So, I'm looking forward to it. And again, thanks, Derek. I, I don't think people realize just how much stress you were under and how you made all the pieces work with the legal agreements with Rhonda. So, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> yes, congratulations to Stuart. And I'm going to, I really found uh, my first time through with, uh, I think pretty much my first time through with uh, Craig's presentation. I found it fascinating. So yeah, every little bit helps and it does add up. Like Karen said, $5 million is nothing to sneeze at. So when we send out those alerts, <coughs> please do something. Yes, it does add up. Um, huge shout out to Derek and Spanglers and the Rhonda and Mayor and Nate. I am super excited about this water tower. I don't live too far from it so I will get to see it every day. I just can't wait for it to get started. Like, can we start it now? <laughs> um, yeah, I just am chomping at the bit to start this. I just can't contain my excitement. So, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. 
I don't know what I can say. Uh, yeah, congratulations to Stuart. He has been an asset to the utility. And uh, for Craig, uh, I, I enjoyed the power supply update. There, there was a lot of interesting things there, and it's, it's good to see that with our diverse portfolio that we're able to do what we can do and still save the amount of money that we are. Uh, like everybody else, I'm really looking forward to this water tower thing. I mean, after after everything we've we've chewed on with this thing and, and the, the little tweaks and updates and stuff, it's, it's it's going to be a great thing for everybody involved. It's going to be a great thing for the community. Um, and Derek, I, I don't know what I can say. I, I know you busted your butt getting everything coordinated. It was no small feat. So thank you for that. Um, that's all I have. I have so, one more thing. Oh, go ahead, Tom. I wanted to say that uh, this is probably going to be big news tomorrow in the paper, and it better be above the fold on front page. Are you looking right at the camera? Right now? <laughs> Hi, Max. That's a good point. That's that's one thing I would like to remark on. Uh, the lady from uh, Village Reporter. The Village that? Reporter, yes. I, I want to thank you for yes. being here personally and getting your information. First hand, I, I I think that's important. That's something yes. that I do yeah. I do personally appreciate. So and you've had a very respectful, well-mannered young man back there as our mm -hmm. guest tonight. Yes. My, my grandson came for the educational experience of seeing how government works. Mm -hmm. I hope we didn't scare him. Away. Yeah, I hope yeah. we didn't scare him. <laughs> <laughs> no. And what Grammy does? <laughs> Gra Grammy does a lot. I see Grammy a lot. So may I add one more thing? Sure, go ahead. Uh, dispatchers, we appreciate the gracious donation yes. towards our part of the project. Thank you again. And the work. I know I know that you, Diana, and Kirk, and Bill, and your team put a lot of work in it. Um, and I know that the design transformed a lot for communication with b <coughs> and I appreciate those open lines of communication because that is the way that we get the best results for everyone. Thank you. Months. That's fun work. We all like it. Yeah, but in between, like starting basically a new candy plant and yeah. doing a downtown <laughs> facility and, you know, all the things that you guys do participate in, I, I think the fact that you can work in the fun work with the real work is pretty impressive too. I would ask too. I, I mean, maybe, maybe you said this, I wasn't paying close attention, but uh, now that it's approved and everything, uh, uh, a roundabout starting date that they're talking about? September. Hopefully the middle of September. September? Great. Anybody else? And what's the social media tag going to be? Like hashtag for the progress? Okay, well, more fun work that you can start working on tomorrow. Let us know. Yes, indeed. I assume, does this have to go before it comes? Well, we'll certainly get it on the agenda for July 18th, but you guys, I think, are clear for what you need for Suez and, and Spangler to get started in Mr. N, so, yeah. Okay. What do you think, Mr. Betts? I think a lot of people have talked about it for a while. Yeah. I don't think City Council knows right. as much, so we're going to need the information as quickly as possible. Sure. I certainly don't anticipate it being a problem. That's not my point. But you got to understand, you don't just... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it needs but, some reinforcements just on Yeah, I, well, I mean, really, I mean, from my, from my perspective, it appears to be a no-brainer, but I would agree uh, it's, it's only one perspective of which is not all the time shared. So I, I always like to make that comment that it's just mine, but we, in the same sense for everyone, I, it, it's new information, so I, it needs to be digested a little bit, but certainly not for weeks or months. This seems to be very straightforward and very helpful. Uh, and. Yeah, I mean, I live across from Bill Martin, so I'm not saying this just to keep good relations with my neighbor, but um, uh, Spangler's has been uh, outstanding for the community for a very long time, and uh, this is just another example of that. So I, I would not anticipate any issues. Well, Nate and I just brushed over. We anticipate you or Derek are both coming to that council meeting and he's going yeah. to share the PowerPoint sure. with me so that I can get it up on council's computer and hopefully, I know a couple of them said they were going to watch online tonight as well. So oh, good. Should be fine. It's one of those things where I get in this executive session, right? So. <laughs>
Any other discussion? If not, I will accept the motion to adjourn the meeting. I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. Tom? <coughs> Dick? Yes, sir. Jim? Yes. Annette? Yes. Karen? Yes.